Basically, we are going to talk about analysis for earthquake and analysis for wind. Two main tetral forces. And this is the summary of topics that we will talk about. I don't want to discuss this. We will go straight ahead. First of all, let's start with earthquake. Basically, based on the type of earthquake that we, we want to design, based on the probability of occurrence, based on what we are going to do for that earthquake, we can divide it into magnitude as well as probability of occurrence together into categories. And these are the categories that you often see, total categories, and we will concentrate on few of them. We have strength level earthquake, SLE, maximum probable earthquake, operational base earthquake, fertility level earthquake, contingency level earthquake, same factor earthquake, maximum design earthquake, and maximum credible earthquake and see. These are different ways of calling the earthquake for the purpose of design. There are two or three very important, um, th this should be not strength, please correct this one, service level earthquake, SLE. It's incorrect. Correct the this slide, service level earthquake, I will also correct here, SLE. We are concerned with three of them, quite, which are quite important. One is called the maximum credible earthquake. We can call it maximum design earthquake or design based earthquake, DBE, MCE, and SLE, service level earthquake. So service level earthquake, design based earthquake, or maximum design earthquake, and maximum credible earthquake. Now, without going into too much detail, this one is the earthquake, maximum possible earthquake that can come to a site due to any reason based on the plates, based on the seismology, based on the ground motion, because based on everything. So the earthquake theoretically should not, or probability wise, should not exceed this earthquake. And normally, this is defined as earthquake that comes every 2,500 years return period. So it's a very, very severe earthquake that only has a probability of occurring once in 2,500 years, or 2% in 50 years, something like that. And second one is a design-based earthquake, PBE, which has a higher probability of coming, but lower level, more regular, 500 years, 475 years, something like that. And then SLE is an earthquake that comes often, and it's a small intensity earthquake, maybe every 50 years, or something like that, or even every 40 years. So we check the structure for these three levels and with different objectives, and we will go into the details later. Uh, seismic analysis problem. Okay, let's get back to the root of the analysis. These are the four basic equations that we can see that define the equilibrium of structures. The first one is a simple string equation, like we talked about at the beginning when I started this, this, this course, that we have K, direct, direct relationship between force and displacement, and stiffness is the constant, or so, so to speak, constant, and we, we, we already know that this is not the right equation, because this, according to this, if the force is infinite, displacement will be infinite, right? Which is, or if the force is very large, displacement will be very large, and large means that if the force is 1 million tons, then displacement could be 1 million centimeters, right? Not possible. That means this equation is especially not true for earthquake. Because earthquake forces can be very, very large, unexpectedly large. So this equation is not useful, much useful for us. Second one is linear dynamic equation, in which, first of all, this is, as you know, static, and it's linear. Second is linear but dynamic. That means we are talking about forces which are changing by time, but the response to those is still considered to be linear. So the, the force in this case is now this side, which is changing by time, coming from earthquake. And internally, 
this force is balanced by not stiffness and displacement, but also damping and velocity and mass and acceleration. You know that already. So the total internal force is is a sum of these three which balances the external force. Then this is also not enough because this also assumes linear response for a, for every structure. Then comes another nonlinear and static, but not dynamic. And this one says that this force and that force are equal, but there is a correction factor which comes because of nonlinearity. And this makes sure, this correction factor makes sure that the this force does not become infinite. Because after some time, this force will start to become so large, it will start to cancel that. So you cannot apply any more force. So this will, in nonlinearity force, internal correction will make sure that the external force cannot go beyond a certain level and the structure will collapse. So no more force can be applied. So this is a nonlinearity of the structure which ensures that in infinite forces or very large forces cannot be applied. So this correction, typically it is, so this is going to cancel that. Right? Then we combine these two together and we come up with the final nonlinear dynamic equation which is the complete description of the structure response. So we have all the dynamics and we have the nonlinearity and then we have the force. And this is the one that describes the complete response of the structure that we are interested in. And this is what we normally do at a western level, or most people deal with that, but we want to deal with this, right, as usual. Now, this is an explanation, what is this correction, force correction coming in, the nonlinearity, and very important to understand this nonlinearity correction here. This is the linear response k u equal to f which will go for infinity, right? But real response is red. So after some time, the real response will go like this and actually it will come down and stop somewhere. So it will start to deviate from the linear response at some point and at any given displacement, the difference between linear and nonlinear force is the correction factor. So as we go further, this different becomes larger and larger. So this does not go as high as that because nonlinear and nonlinearity will correct it. So we will get the real response which displacement will keep increasing but after some time the force will not increase anymore. And in fact after some time the force will drop because this nonlinearity correction will become bigger than the force. Right? So that is how the nonlinearity comes in and corrects the response to be realistic. This is unrealistic response impossible response. This is realistic, real response. We are actually interested in red line. We are not interested in blue line anymore because that's not real. For normal loading, it is not a big problem because normal loadings we are dealing in this range. Forces are and, and the response are within, we are dealing around this area. So the difference between linearity and nonlinearity is not so much so we can ignore it. Seismic is not like that. Seismic can go very large. And so this correction, if you don't apply, we will end up with an unrealistic design. So we need to understand this one. Now you might be saying that it's very easy. You have the blue line, you have the red line, you just find a difference and that will be on in your part. So but what's wrong with that statement? The, what is wrong with this statement is that we don't know the red line. How can we find the difference between a line that does not exist? Because if we knew red line, we, meet, we wouldn't need to worry about anything. We have no way to determine red line. We only have a way to determine blue line. So, by to determine red line, we need the correction between them. And to determine this one, we need to know the red line. So, which means that we are in a pickle, as I said, because we want to calculate something which requires free knowledge of that item, and that is what nonlinearity is all about. So, 
how do we solve solve nonlinear problems normally? Iteration, right? Try and error, try to converge to some solution, right? So step by step, small, 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 small steps until we try to close the main close that. Rather than going this way, we find the differences at every point and then try to remain close to that line, right? So that is how the nonlinear problems are solved. So we have this whole range of all the equations coming from, all the methods coming from combination of excitation, structure and response and we get that eight type of possible response that we can determine. And normally we may need to determine most of them or many of them to compare for different purposes. So we almost always need this linear static analysis because that is our starting point and we need it for weight and other loads and gravity loads. We often need nonlinear static also push over another method and so on. And this is the highest one that we need to do. Right? So all of these are possible, just require more work, more knowledge, more understanding. The difference is if all of you are here and I give you a linear, I ask you to do a linear analysis of the structure, all of you must come to almost the same response because it's a single equation. But if you are doing this one, it is quite possible that all of you will come up with a different answer for the same problem because nonlinearity and dynamics is highly complex. Many, 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 many options to variables or, or paths to choose from and we may not come to the same conclusion. That is why the, the reliability of the nonlinear dynamic analysis is very low unless we understand what's going on. And that's why we will talk more about it, how do we improve the reliability of these methods. So if you can do it one time, does not mean that is your answer. It may not be the answer. In fact, most often it will not be the answer. So we normally need to do nine times and then take the average, or twenty-seven times, or both. Same analysis, different time, different number of times, and then get the trying to get the results from there. So this equation is the one that we are interested in now. This equation is a comprehensive equilibrium equation which covers, if I can say, so you remember in the previous course we had a similar equation for cross section analysis and I said that cross section, that equation can cover every cross section shape material combination and, we, and it doesn't matter what we are talking about. Same is true now for this equation for every structure, every loading, every possibility of material you cannot find a case which does not fit in this one. So it can be modeled and fit within this framework. Right? And that is the, the strength or the power of this equation. That it, every analysis type can be transformed to fit into this equation. Wind load, earthquake load, uh, dynamics, static, damping, no damping, concrete, steel, rebars, fracture, whatever you want to do, it can be within that equation. Because we have these parameters, M, C, K, and F, and L, to take care of everything that we need. Newton's equation was saying F and M into mass into acceleration is equal to F, F is equal to M A. So Newton is only dealing with this part and that part in physics, right? For them, other things do not matter. They, because that is the equation for rigid bodies. If the body is not rigid, then we have these things coming in. And normally structural engineers deal with these two, stiffness and force, because they assume the structure to be soft and deformable. So you get to get to solve those two opposite of Newton, right? We have to combine Newton and engineers, and then we have to add two more items to take care of two other things that both of them did not consider. 
which is damping, energy dissipation, and nonlinearity, change of the response and change of the properties. Right? So this is the dissection of this equation. Mass acceleration, these are force components. Mass into acceleration, F, F is equal to M, M and A, you get a force. Damping into velocity, you get another force. Stiffness into displacement, you get another force. And non-linear non -linear force correction, you get another force. Right? So that's how it will work. And this non-linearity, F into NL, is actually, again, this whole equation is inside that. And continues in that way, because that's how the definition of non-linearity, because that curve itself is still a complete equation of this force. That's what, why it becomes non-linear. Right? So there is a, this equation is, is an inside this equation. And that's what causes this to be a non-linear issue. So, this equation can be used to solve static and dynamic analysis. This is the dynamic part, the blue one, and that one is the static part, the light orange one, and the nonlinearity also has a dynamic and a static part, and the force may have a static and a dynamic part. So that's how you can visualize the equation into dynamic and static components. So if dynamics, if the force does not change by time, you can eliminate this one, you can eliminate that one, and you can eliminate that one, and you, you come to the static nonlinear or static linear equation. Right? If dynamics is not important, right? So that's how you can see where is dynamics coming in and which part is affected by dynamics. Dynamics means the response is changing with time significantly, or the forces are changing with in fact, forces is not important, response changing with time. So, static excitation, dynamic excitation, excitation is the one that creates the response, right? Most of the excitations are actually dynamic in nature, they will change in time. Light load, we consider it to be static, but actually it's not static. When you leave the room, and when you come into the room, the light load is changing with time, right? So, when a car is moving on a, on a highway, on a bridge, the light load is changing with time, so it's not really static. So, in that, say, that is why what I'm saying that excitation is not the only criteria to determine whether we need dynamic analysis or static analysis, because excitation do change with time. Almost everything changes with time. Temperature changes with time, you know, even dead load changes with time. So the, the main parameter to see is the response. If the response changes rapidly because of that, then it's a dynamic problem. If the response does not change rapidly, what is mean rapidly? It's a broad term, quickly, right? How quickly? Right? It's a very interesting. Some people say, oh, if the dynamic part of the response is less than 5%, then you can consider it static problem. But then that requires me to determine the dynamic part first and then neglect it later. So what's the point? I already determined the, the, the dynamic part. Why should I neglect it? 3% or 2%? It doesn't matter. I already determined it. So that is definition does not really work very well. So typically, we, we say that okay, if the response is changing slowly, we can consider it to be static. That means it's longer than a few seconds. Dynamics is typically of the order of seconds, not minutes or days. If something is changing in seconds or less than a second, then it has a dynamic impact. Otherwise, it may not have. Linear and non-linear. So blue is all linear and non-linear is here. And out of that, damping can be non-linear, stiffness can be. So within this non-linear component, the primary sources of non-linearity are damping and stiffness. 
stiffness is highly nonlinear. Damping can be linear or nonlinear. So this force component and the force itself can be kind of nonlinear. Right? The application of force may not be linear from zero to full full force. Right? Not applied uniformly in equal intervals. Maybe in the beginning it is applied a little bit, then suddenly applied a lot, then applied slowly. Right? So it becomes a nonlinear application of the load. It may be applied slowly. Today it is like this, tomorrow becomes 10 times, then becomes 3 times less. Right? So it's a nonlinear load application, but it's static because it is applied over a day, not immediately. Earthquake, on the other hand, is both nonlinear and dynamic. Right? So that means it's earthquake forces generated by the ground motions are highly dynamic and highly nonlinear. One time they are positive, the other side they are negative. So the variation is very large. So we are dealing with the dealing with earthquake, we are dealing with a highly nonlinear, highly dynamic response and force. Stiffness, the main culprit in this whole problem is stiffness. Just now we said stiffness is a constant. It is hardly a constant. I told you many times, stiffness is not a constant. Right? Modulus of elasticity is not a constant. It's a wrong term. We should never call them constant. They do not remain, they change. Right? So stiffness changes. You have seen this slide before also in the last course. Material stiffness has a linear and nonlinear part. First linear, then nonlinear. Section properties linear and nonlinear. Cross section geometry linear, nonlinear. Member stiffness linear, nonlinear. Member geometry linear, nonlinear. So the whole structure becomes highly nonlinear when you add all the nonlinearities together. Right? Especially reinforced concrete. So to treat stiffness as linear is not a good thing, not realistic. So if you want to do a realistic analysis, especially for earthquake, we have to treat stiffness as nonlinear. That is very important. So for little loads, both for wind, high winds, and for earthquake or blast, we need to treat these things nonlinearly. Seismic analysis. This is a very important slide. Please spend a few minutes on this and try to understand what's going on here. Because this is a summary of all the seismic analysis or analysis for earthquake in terms of the equations that we have or methods we have. Everything is here. This is the main equation. We talked about that. This equation can be applied in many ways to do many types of seismic analysis that you will be required to do or that you can do. First of all, you can use only this part and this part and you can say equipment static analysis. The one that the courts use, you apply the force earthquake as if it is as if it is a force acting on each floor and then you do the analysis for those forces. That is called equipment static analysis. Forces coming from earthquake, equipment, not real, applied at the floor levels and we do the analysis. That is what the codes normally do or the minimum things that we do. So this, these two parts of the equation can give us the, this method. Then we could come up with another equation by take, taking this part and this part and this part and we say this is pushover analysis or nonlinear static analysis of the kind called pushover. That means we are pushing the structure with very large forces but doing it slowly. So the dynamic effects are taken out but the large force and nonlinearity are kept intact. So we push until structure falls down, not elastically but nonlinearly. So we can do pushover analysis. Pushover means that we push the structure over until it falls down. But you do it with a one directional slowly applied loading to simulate the collapse. Then we can do response spectrum analysis. Response spectrum analysis is a pseudo dynamic analysis. It's kind of dynamic, but not fully dynamic, but it, is, it has some dynamic 
components. So the small spectrum analysis comes from this one and that one, but in this case, we also take into account the free vibration involved in there. Right? So we do analysis based on the free vibration modal response and combine it with the actual mass and actual stiffness and then we get the we scale it down based on the actual properties and then we get a equivalent we get a spot spectrum analysis or we could use dynamics completely with the time history analysis linear time history analysis without knowing reality or of course we can use the whole equation all of the components which is called a full non-linear dynamic Linus analysis, right? So how many methods? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Six type of analysis we can do from this equation to solve six type of earthquake or seismic analysis problems, right? All of this you can do in ETAPS and SAP, right? Even more. Right? So that means we have the capability to do whatever analysis we want as long as we have the information. So why doesn't everybody do this? So basic problem is that these things are very hard to get the right numbers and right data. And let me start by saying where is the real problem line? Exploration records. To solve this equation you need this thing right you need that actually f on the side is, is this one you need the down motion record to excite this to, to, to solve this equation you need a ground motion that you will assign for the structure to solve otherwise you are trying to determine the excitation for what if you do not know how the ground is going to shake this equation is useless, right? Because it depends on the acceleration of the ground. So that is the problem number one, the biggest problem. Because we do not know earthquake shaking at that site uh, until earthquake is already passed and we measure it. That is the biggest number one issue in this problem. That ground motion that we want to assign here to solve this equation is not known until the earthquake comes at that site, not at source. So as you know, earthquake travels from there and modified by the ground and this and that and that and that and finally comes here, then the ground is shaking, then the foundation comes, the foundation is shaking and then the structure is shaking. Right? So we don't know what is the shaking at the foundation level of this structure. Problem number one. Problem number two, we do not know, like I said, what this what is damping? What is damping by the way? Can anybody say you are how do you know what is what do you know about damping? Right, right, many, 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 many things. So damping is a complex phenomena. We do not know what is causing damping. It's a material damping, it's a motor damping, it's a friction damping, it's a yielding damping, it's a friction damping, it's what? So damping is a complex phenomena and we do not know where is the damping coming from and what is the value of damping. No, no idea. Actually, least known parameter in this equation after ground motion is damping. Next one is stiffness, non-linearity. Some of you people said non-linearity in material, non-linearity everywhere. We do not know all of those numbers. So which means basically the equation is beautiful but we don't have this data correctly. We don't have the data for non-linearity correctly and even the Mass, okay, mass can be estimated more or less correctly. So basically the problem lies with three parameters, ground motion, damping, and nonlinearity. And these are the ones that make this equation up. So if you take them out, nothing is left. 
So we have an issue with that. And then the final issue is the tools to do this program, they cost a lot unless you pirate them, which is not good. Right? So if you want to buy these programs, not everybody can afford them. Ten thousand dollars for e taps, for example. Right? Not every designer can afford it. So they don't have the tools, they don't have the training, they don't have the data to do this one. And they're not getting paid enough to do it. So there are many other factors, social factors also. But technically these are the issues. I don't want to repeat this, I'm sure you all know. Right? So just to remind that this is important for us to determine the single degree and multi degree freedom and the response from there. Okay. Forces generated by earthquake. Earthquake, as you know, is one of the force which is not a force. It's a displacement. <coughs> and force is generated by the structure. It's not an applied force. Unlike any other force, earthquake force is not a force applied to the structure. It's a displacement applied to the ground or to the foundation. And because of that displacement, forces are generated. And this is where the whole trick lies in earthquake or seismic design that this force is not an external force. It is generated by the structure itself. So the problem for generating the force is the structure itself because it is generated by the structure. It is not coming from earthquake. Earthquake is a cause but not the primary parameter to determine the force. The force is being generated by the three things inside the structure, mass, damping, and stiffness, and nonlinearity. So in fact, there is no force coming from outside. Displacement is coming. So theoretically speaking, the structure can choose not to generate any force because of that displacement. Right? And what is that called? Base oscillation. You can isolate the base of the structure from the ground that you let the ground move and you don't let the structure move and no forces will be generated. So actually the structure has a choice not to generate any forces because of earthquake by isolating its base. Zero force is generated in that case. No matter how strong the earthquake is. Right? So that means we can have a situation easily, okay, not so easily, but we can have a situation in which the earthquake forces on a structure are zero. So anything between zero force to a fully connected elastic structure, we have all the options in between. So the trick on earthquake design is not to generate too many forces in the structure. Control the forces generated in the structure. That is the key to seismic design because if you let the forces be generated, you may not be able to design for them. So the philosophy of structural design of the seismic design is simple. Be very strong for weak earthquake and be very weak for strong earthquake. So if the earthquake is small, you can, you are strong enough, you have enough strength, go with it. But if you think earthquake is too strong and if you try to go with it, you will break or collapse, then yield yourself, reduce the forces in yourself by creating new damping, by creating new things, damage. Right? We will talk about that. So the structure should be able to respond intelligently to earthquake. And that is the way seismic design should be carried out, intelligent response to ground motion. That is why we have three levels of earthquakes. SLE, design basis, and MLMZ. For SLE, you respond as the earthquake wants you to respond, elastically, so no damage, no change. After earthquake is gone, the structure is perfect. 
you still use it. If the earthquake is stronger than that, the design vessel earthquake, you let yourself crack a little bit, and if you crack a little bit, stiffness will reduce. Stiffness will reduce, the stiffness force component will reduce because force is generated by the structure. So if the, reduce, if the stiffness is reduced, internal force generated by stiffness component in that equation will reduce. Increase your damping. So that damping will reduce the force because the, the proportion is inverse. Right? Mass you cannot do much about. So the structure should be intelligent to change its damping and stiffness properties based on the level of the earthquake. And if this earthquake is MCE, maximum credible earthquake, then just do whatever you like, just don't fall down. And after the earthquake, people may have to come and demolish the structure, but it should not fall down during the earthquake. After people go, then it's okay. That's the key. That's why three levels of earthquakes are needed. That's why three different approaches are needed. And that is what was demonstrated in two earthquakes I keep giving that example, maybe I'm sure Dr. Penang gives that example also. Haiti earthquake and the Chile earthquake. You know about that, right? Yes, no? The comparison between the two? No. Haiti earthquake came, 200,000 people died, every building collapsed, they were brittle, every building tried to respond to the earthquake. It was a strong earthquake, but not the strongest. The Chile earthquake, after a couple of months, was about 500 times stronger than this one in terms of energy release. But Chile buildings were designed properly. They have a very good design methods and codes and strict control, just like Japan. And after that earthquake, a few people lost their life, very few. But most of the buildings got damaged so much that they had to be replaced. So 15 billion dollars of damage occurred, but not many people died. So the structures responded intelligently. They collapsed themselves, they damaged themselves, allowing the people to escape. And after that, the structure had to be demolished and built again. Okay, that's a financial cost, but human life was spared. That is the purpose of the building, right? Of course, now people are saying that is not good, if the building should also not you know, the economic cost should also be less. That's another story. Same thing in Japan. 9.0 Victor. Almost close to the maximum possible 10. Right? Hardly any building collapsed. If there was no tsunami, there would be no damage. Buildings swayed. You must have seen videos. Swaying like anything. But not collapsing. Right? They have isolators, they have dampers, they have all those things installed in the buildings that prevented the buildings from responding in the building. So they have many things. So this, the, the point is, and I'm sure Dr. Penning shows you that table with the three things that shape, right? This is the same thing. So response of the different buildings to the same ground motion is not the same. The force generated in each structure, structure is not the same for the same earthquake on the same side. That is the key. So as a designer, you have the ability or the power to control what forces will be generated in your in your building. It is not that you have forces to design for. You have a motion to design for. And that is the understanding that many engineers do not have. They think earthquake is a force. They're trying to design the structure for the force. In fact, earthquake is a motion. We need to design for the motion, not for the forces. Forces are generated as a result of the motion, and we can control that. So that is the another key, as you might say, to, to earthquake response is that we control the demand or forces, not use the forces that you calculate. And this is again showing you the effects of them. This is a very good book, by the way. You people should get it. The two pictures that I took from this is, I think, by an Indian author. Very nicely done book. I will tell you. Huh? No, not Chopra. No, it's not Chopra. This is uh, Murthy. Vivian Murthy or something like that. It's a very good book on uh, understanding earthquake response. And some of my diagrams are taken from there. I have the name somewhere. You will see it here. 
it's available clearly on the internet because it was published as a government sponsored project so it's free so basically we have this system NAS stiffness and damping and you manipulate and then this is shaking force generated here is so this is a mass which is moving the force generated here is controlled by these two things mass and stiffness I mean mass and I'm sorry stiffness and damping assuming the mass does not change so you can do something about stiffness you can do something about damping and you can control the force that's that's the bottom line Force reversal, that is another problem that we have to deal with. Unlike many other forces, gravity forces, which are applied only one time and only applied down, seismic force and also wind force, they are changing direction all the time, very, very rapidly. Right? So one time the structure is pushed this way, another time the structure is pushed the other way. So, if the structure is pushed too much in one direction, it, is, it gets damaged, it reduces the ability to respond second time on the other direction or the same direction. So, this, I'm, I'm sure you're studying about this, this cyclic force and deformation response creates the critical parameters that are very important for earthquake and that is energy dissipation which is this inside this one and also degradation which is the strength loss that you go later on that one so this this force displacement cyclic response curve or curves or this one is the key input to damping and to the force to the nonlinearity so nonlinearity is determined by this one, as you can see from here, this is nonlinearity, and this loop determines damping. Right? So nonlinearity and damping are interlinked, but this is only part of the damping. There are many other dampings. Right? This is the damping which is coming from the nonlinear energy absorption and degradation, but there are other dampings which also need to be considered. Right? So damping is a complex term, difficult to understand and difficult to, to, to interpret and put the values. Artificial dampers, you know, modal damping, this and that. So, but anyway, so basically we need to know this as an input to the program. So that program can, so input will come from each member, each material, each section we need to define this, these two information so the program can use this information to solve the big equation that we are trying to solve right? without that, that equation cannot be solved and this is not, this is not known, this is very very hard to determine and to know right? so this is now, yeah, this is taken from Moti to 2004 find this he explains it very nice, it's a good book, very, very clear and very concept, very lot of diagrams, very making everything very, very clear. So you should you should read that. Effect of inertia on a building, you know, when you move it, it deforms, and then like I said, you can have all kinds of so if the motion is this way and the stiffness is very large, force generated will be very large. If the, if the motion is this way, the structure is flexible, force generated will be Different. So this is when it now brings us to another complication that the same earthquake on the same stru uh, structure can produce different response or force in two different directions or different directions because the stiffness in the two directions may not be the same and damping may, may, damping may not be the same. So the response is not the same. So the force is not the same. So that means earthquake coming from this direction, different force. Earthquake coming from that direction, different force. Earthquake coming from diagonally, different force. So same structure will generate different forces in different directions for 
same earthquake motion because its stiffness is not the same in every direction. As you can see, different stiffness in this direction because the ball, same ball in this direction is very flexible. So, which one will be the larger force here or there? Which force will be larger? This direction or this direction? Obviously, if this stiffness is large, force will be large. If this stiffness is small, force will be small. It's very simple. So, and that is the key. If you want to reduce the forces on the structure, you reduce the stiffness. But the negative effect is that if you reduce the stiffness, the displacement is large. But you reduce the force. So, it's a complicated thing. You need to, need, you need to create a balance where the force is reduced, but because of the reduced stiffness, the displacement is increased. Right? So, you want to find a balance in which the reduced force because of reduced displacement is still within the limit of the displacement. Let me repeat again. So, we know that force in this direction where the stiffness is large will be large. Force in this direction where the stiffness is small will be small. But the problem is here the stiffness is large, even the force is large, displacement will be small because stiffness is large. Right? But strength will be a problem because large force is generated. Here the stiffness is small, force will be small, but because stiffness is small, displacement will be large. And because the stiffness is small, member will be small, so the force will be large for the small member. So it's not a straightforward answer. If you reduce the stiffness too much, displacement will be too much, which may not be what you want because too much displacement is not acceptable. Which means we have to control both at the same time. We have to control the displacements and we have to control the forces. So we have to find a system in which the force is also reduced and displacement is also not increased. Right? That's where damping comes in. That can help us do that. Reduces the force but does not reduce the stiffness. So instead of reducing, reducing the stiffness part of the equation, we reduce the damping part of the equation by increasing the damping. So, I will stop here because too many, too many concepts today. Basically, seismic design is very, very different from design for any other forces because the fact that seismic, seismic is not a force, it's a displacement. You are designing for displacement, not for a force. And that changes everything. Right? So, force is generated by your, by your structure, so which means you have the ability to control how much force will be generated in the structure? Any questions? <laughs>